for joining us um, for podcast with Auto App. Um, yeah, I'm quite on brand today, but uh, that's because I, I had another previous engagement. But anyway, welcome to our podcast. Um, today, we are pleased to have our guests, our first Zoom guests. So far, all our meetings have been face to face. And uh, so this is new. So for our listeners, if the audio or video quality is uh, a bit different from what you're used to, um, you know, please bear with us. But uh, it's up to Zoom now to, to, uh, to give us the, the quality we need. Anyway, um, so Klaus, um, how do I pronounce your last name? Is it Busa? Absolutely perfect, Sean. You did you did you did perfect on first try. Oh, great! Thank you. So, so where are you from originally? So, Sean, first of all, thank you so much for having me. It's, it's an absolute honor. And you're right, Zoom. It's it's fantastic. Now we're sitting on the opposite side of the planet. Yeah. And thanks to technology, we can speak real time. So that's great. Um, I'm calling you currently from Torino, Italy, but I was born uh, in Germany many, many years ago. And then okay. we are Great Britain, the US, and uh, also some jobs in Germany. I found myself here in Italy. I see. Okay. All right. Well, as I like to sort of um, set the table and, and catch our, whoever is listening to this podcast up, um, can you walk us through your origin story of how you came to be where you are? How did you get to be an automotive designer? How long is this podcast, Sean? <laughs> as long as you <laughs> want it to be. Okay, uh, so let me start with, with a, like a medium length version. So um, I grew up with the idea of becoming a designer. You know, I was growing up in northern Germany and there was not much going on. It was very agricultural. But this, this, when I heard about this word design, it had this promise of the world in it. It had this fantastic sound to it. And at that time, I didn't connect cars with design, but I had a passion for cars, mostly out of TV shows, because again, living in an agricultural area, all my car culture came out of TV shows. And it's the typical American ones, American Vice, um, Magnum, etc. right? Okay. And so eventually, I was able to connect these two, and I realized, wow, there's you can design cars. So I learned about the Pininfarinas, the Giugiaros, the Betones. My first car that I admired was the Lamborghini Countach. Uh, that yeah. was the car as a poster in my bedroom. Of course. Uh, for, those, you know, for some of your listeners, you don't know that our age, we had posters of cars in our bedroom. Exactly. I don't know if, that. yeah. don't know if that's the thing today. I so, don't know either. Uh, yeah, I was going to ask you that. That's actually my second question. But uh, go on, yeah, before we get to that. <laughs> So um, I uh, went to art school and then I found myself um, through some lucky coincidence uh, doing internship uh, in the design office at Mercedes. Um, I studied in England and then my first job was right back at Mercedes-Benz where I worked for 10 years. And that was a wonderful time because uh, I think there's barely another company where you can learn design foundations as well as you can with Mercedes-Benz. I mean, they, they have been fantastic. And they're still very, very good today, you know? So I'm guessing and that then, era, Bruno Sacco was uh, in correct, charge? Yeah, yeah. Yes, so exactly. He was actually there for a few more years and Peter Pfeiffer took over. And then um, when we merged with Daimler Chrysler, I was asked to join the team in the US as, as an expat. Mm -hmm. So I did that. And when Daimler Chrysler decided to demerge, I decided to stay in the US because at that time I really fell in love with the American car culture, the American design culture, team spirit. Um, my new best friend and mentor and boss was Ralph Gilles, our global head of design, not only for Maserati, but for Jeep, Dodge, etc. And then I spent 10 years in the US. And in the meantime, some of you might recall that after Chrysler uh, separated from, from Daimler, they were picked up first by an investor company, Cerberus, and then by the Fiat Group, FCA was created. And I got to work with the magnificent um, Sergio Marchiona. Mm. Uh, Sergio and I had a really good relationship, um, which then eventually landed me the assignment to come to Italy and take uh, charge of the Italian design operations. At that time, that, in, that included Alfa Romeo, Lancia, Fiat, and Maserati. Right. And then uh, since then, we have merged with uh, our French colleagues into Stellantis. So we have reorganized everything. And currently, I'm responsible for Maserati. 
but also for um, all Jeep uh, Europe design and then also for our agency Stellantis Design Studio that I'm working out of Paris. So this is the medium length version. Hopefully this was okay, Sheldon. <laughs> yeah, that's perfect. Yeah, yeah. So, I mean, basically you've spent most of your career, um, let's say at Chrysler, and, uh, for the most part, going through different uh, ownership uh, variations. Um, and and whereabouts uh, were you in the US? Where were you uh, stationed? During my time, yeah, during my time in the US, uh, we were in Michigan. Uh, the design office is in Auburn Hills, which is just forty five minutes north of Detroit, and that's where I where I lived for for about ten years. That's correct, Sean. I see. And when where are you today? Where are you talking to me from? So now we are in in the beautiful city of Torino in northern Italy. Oh, nice. Um, what might be a surprise to some of your listeners, we're not in Modena. The design office is not in Modena. In Modena, we have the headquarters of Maserati and also the production of our magnificent MC20 supercar. Yeah. But the design studio is actually in Torino because here we have all the Italian brands under one roof together with Alfa Romeo, Lancia and Fiat. Got it, got it. So is it important for a design studio to be in a certain location? Uh, what, how does it affect your, your, your Yeah, I, I think it's a great question, Sheldon, and, and, and the answer is yes, um, because for us to be creative, we need to recharge our creativity, and um, you can do that in many ways. Mm, travel is an important part, so everyone can do that. You don't have to be in Torino, but you, know, you don't travel 365 days a year, so the daily insertion of creativity and energy is super, super important for uh, any designer, not just car designers. And here in Torino, we are extremely blessed because Torino was the first capital of Italy. So it has a lot of beautiful historical buildings. But even more fascinating is that within an hour, hour and a half of drive, you're in, in some of the most beautiful areas of the world. You can be in the Alps and uh, in Olympic ski resorts. You can be at Lake Como, Milano. You at the Mediterranean Sea or in the wonderful wine region of Italy. And everything is just an hour, hour and a half by car. So there's so much to do where you can recharge your energy here. Nice, nice. So um, back to what you mentioned with posters on the wall and stuff like that. I mean, most car designers um, who are active today um, they, they tell a similar story that they were inspired by cars like a Lamborghini Countach or a Ferrari or some uh, super sports car um, for the most part. You obviously, uh, you, you work with the younger, the next generation of upcoming designers and interns and things like that. Um, where do you see them getting their inspiration from and how do you think this will influence the future of car design? Yeah, that's a great question, uh, Sheldon, and I think um, you're going right away to some of the most important challenges that every head of design faces when you're building your team and you're setting up for the future. So you, you said it correct, like my generation, we had either, probably either the Countach or the Testarossa, one of those two icons. Yeah. And today, um, I think I see more of a mix. You still have uh, designers joining the team that... Um, are hooked to one iconic car of the past. Um, most of them are much more diverse, um, but they still have that love for the car because otherwise they would go into another area. If they would uh, be hooked up on fashion design, that's where they would go or industrial design. So there is still gasoline in their blood, right? There are still these cars. Um, depending on the age, there are different cars that they admire and aspire to, but there's still this ad admiration for the car. But the, the skill set and uh, the inspirational background that bringing to the game today has completely changed. I would say when, when I started, I only looked at cars. And it got me where I am, so clearly that, that didn't hurt me. But today, the designers are bringing so much more, and we're expecting so much more, especially for a brand like Maserati, because Maserati is more than just metal and, and, and carbon fiber. It's a whole environment. So the designers need to have an affinity. They need to understand architecture, fashion, social, uh, the society, um, hip hop culture, uh, all these things. So the portfolio of knowledge and inspiration they have is much, much bigger than what we had back in the day. I see. And, and do you think this will result in better designs? I think, Sheldon, it will be, it will be uh, able to go to the next level. Keep in mind, 
you know, when we look, let's look back at that time when Kuntaj and uh, Ferrari Testarossa were invented. There were very, very few um, brands of that caliber. There was Ferrari, Lamborghini. Um, there was no Pagani yet, right? You had uh, a completely different uh, set of, of, of cars. There was no Koenigsegg yet. So the, the amount of hypercars or supercars were extremely limited. So this has, has grown. The other thing is, you know, when you look at car design, it started becoming repetitive. Uh, in the 50s and 60s, car design was fresh. It was a very elegant fuselage uh, design. The Italians were really at the top of their game. Also in the 70s, when you had this wedge-shaped design, the engine for the first time went into the rear of the car. So proportions were different. 80s, 90s, again, technology changed, design changed. And then with the 2000, car design all over the world started talking about retro design, mm -hmm. you know, looking back at the rearview mirror. And I feel we're coming to the end of this phase. Um, we've been looking in the rearview mirror for 20 years as an industry, not all of us, but some of us. And I think now it's time to open that door to that next, to that next generation of design and really delivering something fresh. Now you can imagine if there's only 10 car companies in the world, it's easier to do something no one has done before. Now we have more than 100 car companies and they're all very, very good. So to do something fresh and new and not something ridiculous that is really really difficult so yes that's why we're expecting so much more from the designers that's why it's so much more important to really understand all aspects of design culture and, and technology so what is your sort of personal design philosophy how, how do you approach something when you're given a brief or when you set out to design a new car what, what, what's the first thing in your mind yeah, thank you for that question, Sheldon. Uh, indeed, um, the first thing we do, this might come as a surprise, we don't sketch, we talk. Okay. Because, uh, and this is not only uh, Maserati, also when uh, with my team, I designed the new Cinque Cento Electric, or when we were designing Alfa Romeo, or back in the US, we we're designing uh, Jeeps. We sit down and we have this conversation about what is this car going to do for the brand, and where does the brand want to go? And this is a discussion that might take days, weeks, months, probably not, that's a stretch, but certainly weeks. And we would sit in a room that we would pepper the walls with all kinds of inspiration. Everything is fair game. The designers can put on the wall whatever they think will contribute to this conversation. We also look at society. We also look at, you know, when you when you keep in mind the impact of the early 2000s of 9-11 on, on, on design itself, you saw two trends. One trend was you had the Humvees, the Hummers, right? 23 years ago, um, you know, car design took two shapes. One was very protective car design because everyone was suddenly concerned. The other, and then it also, I think, paved the way for the retro romantic design because people try to find security and safety by looking into the rearview mirror. In those things, you need to understand, you cannot just sit down and draw a line and have a debate about should the line be curved like this or curved like that. That's styling. We go much deeper. We, we try to really understand what is, coming back to Maserati, what is the role of a supercar for society? And every, every country, every continent is slightly different. In the US, we still have a car culture where I can pull up to the gas station in a supercar and a person will come up to me and say, hey, wow, man, this is such a cool car. One day I wanna drive a car like this. And then there's other cultures in Northern, in Northern Europe, for example, where the role of an SUV or supercar inside a city is much more critically viewed. So these are debates, these are, these are exchanges we have, not only about the line. The line will find itself once we have the concept of the car. Maserati, I mean, we've known, it's been known for uh, Gran Turismos and uh, sports cars and stuff like that, but and then, of course, the Quattroporte and, uh, you know, the four-door cars. But how versatile does it, does it need to be versatile? Or can you just continue as a brand doing what you're doing? Or do you need to look elsewhere, you know? So, yeah, a good question, Sheldon, again. Um, what is Maserati about? Maserati has one north star, one guiding uh, light, and that's the Gran Turismo. Why? Because the Gran Turismo, in its name expresses what our brand in general is about. We, we build Gran Turismo. So let me, allow me quickly to summarize what our views of what a Gran Turismo is so there's no confusion. 
The idea of Gran Turismo emerged in the late 40s because at that time or before that time, when you wanted to race a car, you needed a race car. Okay. You could not take your road car on a racetrack like we do today. So you had a race car. And then for the road, you had a road car. These two things did not mix. Eventually, uh, I think it was in 1947, which coincided with Maserati building its first road legal Gran Turismo. In 1947, I believe it was, the racing classification of Gran Turismo was created here in Italy and allowed you basically to come to the track with your road car, prepared, of course, you know, and then you can race the car and then you drive home. So this idea of, of combining the performance needed for the racetrack and the comfort needed for the road, this combination created the class of Gran Turismo, the idea of Gran Turismo. I, I want to say clearly, Maserati did not invent Gran Turismo, but I think there's mm. no other brand today that embraces the concept of Gran Turismo as much as Maserati does. So in other words, when you now look at our portfolio, in the middle you have the car that we actually call Gran Turismo, where we just launched the new Gran Turismo. Mm. And I, I, if I may, I want to come back to that car in just one second. And then you can look left and right, and you can say, okay, the MC20, of course, is a supercar, but within the field of supercars, it's still a Gran Turismo, because for those of you who will have a chance to drive it, you will see how amazing it is on the track, but you'll be blown away how amazing it is on the road. And there's a lot of things we do. We just add a few more millimeters to the roof height to give you more space cabin. Mm -hmm. We really package the central tunnel low and tight so that you have more space in the cabin. So there's a lot of things we do. Also, the way the door open to allow you to get easy in and out, and then also the suspension setup. So we do everything to give you this long distance capability of what we do. Now, if you look to the other side of the spectrum of, of uh, Gran Turismo, you look at a vehicle like a Reca the Grecale. Now, people would call it an SUV. I don't like the term SUV. For me, it's a Gran Turismo. It's a Gran Turismo in a different size. Because when you, again, have the chance to drive a Grecale, within five minutes, you will forget that you're sitting slightly elevated. The suspension setup, uh, the people behind how the car performs are the same people who created the MC20 and the Gran Turismo. So immediately you'll be transformed in a world where you can really feel the performance, but on a different space uh, environment. So in other words, if you have a dog, you can't get an MC20, you need the Calecala, but they're both in a way Maserati Gran Turismo. So what does it mean for design shell? Maybe this is where you were trying to take me with your question. So Maserati design is something that needs to be needs to have a longevity because most of our cars go into collection. And, and I myself, I, I, I'm judging in some of the most prestigious Concours d'Elegance here in Europe. And so I, I really have educated myself or have received this perspective of what makes a car really special in the long run. And so I'm applying this with my team to the design of Maserati. There are certain elements we do, but the key is that the car is, has a, a visual longevity and looks in 30 years as beautiful as it does today. Okay, interesting that uh, what you said about a Grecale, that, that you don't view it as an SUV. Uh, let me ask you then about the Levante. So you put you have the Grecale and the Levante, and to, to my eyes, they are quite similar in size. How would you distinguish the two or differentiate the two? Per, yeah, great question. So obviously the Grecal is a much fresher product. Uh, so it, it carries our latest uh, technology, our latest uh, engineering know-how. So again, when you sit in the car, uh, you feel immediately almost the same driving experience like in a Gran Turismo. It cannot be the same because the center of gravity is higher, but it has this wonderful driving experience. We really I did a great job on the packaging to give you good cabin space. But most striking is for those of you who might have seen it, the inside of the car has really stepped forward, uh, not catching up with the competition, but I think going to the front of the competition because we have a wonderful screen technology, but it done in a way that it does not scream like, look at me in your eye, because there's too many cars right now where screens are positioned in a way that you cannot ignore them, right? They're almost distracting. But a Maserati, as you know, is all about the driving experience. So we have positioned the screens that your hand beautifully can fall on it without effort. But at the same time, the screen is there with all this beautiful functionality, but it does not distract you. 
So and there's so many more things I could tell you about the Grecale, but what is the, the, the Levante? The Levante has, a, has another level of audacity to it still. Um, it's not, it's longer, but it doesn't necessarily mean it's a massive SUV. It's actually, I would say, uh, uh, almost like a coupe raced. It's a much more tight vehicle. It's a much more hedonistic vehicle. It has still the V8, the Trofeo. We're selling now the final uh, V8s of that car. It's called the Ultima Series. So if you want to secure your last Levante V8, this is the moment to go to the dealership. And you still can experience this. In the in the Levante, uh, sorry, in the Grecale, on the other hand, we have the wonderful uh, V6 from the MC20. But those cars have a completely different character. The, the Grecale was really designed with this idea, every day exceptional, because we heard from our customers, well, I have my Maserati for the weekend, but I need a car that I can drive every day. And so that's why we created the Grecala. So those cars are have different characters in that sense. So you, you touched on the point about the last V8 and things like that. Um, for me, I'll share with you a personal story. I think my first, um, my early exposure to Maserati as a brand um, was with the Bi Turbo that um, we happened to be uh, parked alongside at a traffic light one day and my my dad um, he'd wind down the windows and says no no listen li listen to this and he wind down the windows and heard this fantastic throbbing um, this deep uh, exhaust note and I thought like yeah. wow and every time uh, a Maserati I pull up next to the lights or whatever I will Take, you know, I would try to savor that sound and uh, it, uh, that noise is, is associated uh, so much with the identity of the brand. I think I sh uh, other enthusiasts share that brand with me. But when moving now to an electric future and, and, and you just touched on that uh, this is possibly the last V8s that we will, last time we will see V8s in the, in, in the Maserati and then later on eventually starts to move into electrification and uh, I suspect that noise will not be there anymore. How do you console this with the identity of the brand? And you know, yeah, wonderful question, Sheldon. Thank you for that. So let's let's start in 1947 with our first road car, um, the A6 1500. That was a four cylinder. Uh, we we started actually no, that was a six cylinder car, but we actually started with four cylinder. So I, I often interact with, with our customers and they say, Maserati has to be V8. Well, we started with four cylinders. Then we moved to six cylinders, then to eight, very briefly to 12, only with the MC12. Then we uh, went, now we are back at six cylinder. And, and let's talk about first about the V6 Natuno engine, which is a magnificent engine. We, we also put that engine in a, in a modified version into our new hypercar, the MC Extrema, where it delivers 720 horsepower, which is just shy of the completely um, unrestricted MC12 Corsa version, which was 745. So half, half the engine size, and you're delivering more or less the same power as the MC12 from the 2005 legendary time. So just that just shows what is capable with, with engine technology. But let's take another look at why we go from ICE to, to electric. Just with, you know, propeller planes. I love propeller planes. When I lived in the U.S., I always went to the air shows and those warbirds, you know, they, you know, with those thousand horsepower propeller engines, they just sound magnificent. But while there are still propeller planes and while propeller planes can still improve slightly by 1% or by half a percent, to really go fast, you had to step to another technology and you had to go to the jet technology. And we're at this point, uh, the ICE, um, we can still fine tune the ICE. And there's gonna be always another ICE engine being slightly better, incrementally, 1%, 2% better. But you really wanna take that next step forward, you go electric. And I've had the, uh, the pleasure, of course, to drive already our electric lineup, the Gran Turismo and the Grecale. And I can tell you, let me take the Gran Turismo as an example. The Gran Turismo is not that typical uh, electric car architecture that you know maybe in the market. A lot of electric cars, they have this, what we call the skateboard platform that they put underneath your seat. So that means you, you sit higher, even in a sports car. Not only do you sit higher, but because of the battery being all the way underneath the seat and outward, 
the, the, the weight is all the way outboard, right? So your, your, your um, handling of the car you, it tends to, to um, understeer because you have all the weight, all the uh, G-force. So what our engineers have done is they kept the batteries inside between the seats. Now that does two things. Again, the seats stay extremely low. We are the lowest electric car with a Gran Turismo in that, in that segment. And because you have the batteries in the center of the car, the weight is centered to the car, so it doesn't push out. Now, if you now combine that with all the lessons learned from Formula E, where it's all about software, you're moving this 750 horsepower to every wheel individually where it's needed in a split second. And I can tell you, Sheldon, when you drive that car, you don't need the sound of a VA because you have the sound of yourself screaming. It is absolutely, <laughs> it is absolutely insane. Well, oh, okay. So you are confident that uh, Maseratis will continue to be exciting. Uh... I am, Sheldon. I absolutely am. But I can tell you also, we don't need, and we do, we do not fight right now. But none of our, none of your listeners need to be concerned because if you want a V8, you can buy it right now. You know, uh, you can buy a V6 still for the foreseeable future. Before we go all electric, uh, it's not going to be tomorrow or next week. It's still going to take a little bit longer than that. But also let me squeeze in this one. Uh, again, if you like V8, we are, I think, I don't know if we might have a few pieces left. We're selling also the last V8 version of the Ghibli. Yeah. And uh, our engineers have um, find a magic recipe to tune the engine in a way that it delivers uh, a speed of 334 kilometers per hour top speed, wow, which makes so the Ghibli amazing. the fastest sedan on the planet. Let's do it. Three hundred four. Are you that's uh, called the Ghibli three three four, and that, that's going to be our last hurrah for the Ghibli V eight. Oh, that sounds amazing! I, I actually drove a Ghibli this morning. Uh, obviously, not not the three three four, but when you start up the engine and the revs climb and that surrounding of the cockpit with the leather and the Alcantara takes you right back, and you just kind of get it straight away uh, in the first uh, you know ten seconds of being in this car how it's different from just being another uh, executive or luxury sedan. Yeah. Klaus, yeah. Uh, I think that's all the time we have for thank you for joining us today. Uh, I hope to meet you whenever you're in Singapore. Yeah. Yeah, for Singapore is still on my to-do list. I have not been. I hear all these amazing stories. Can't wait to visit you. But Sheldon, thank you so much for having me. It was an absolute pleasure. Thank you so much again. Thank you, Klaus. Yeah, take care.